I think we are ready to proceed here. Why don't we start with, with the first one? Um, like you to to talk for a few moments about what you see as being most wrong about modern agriculture and, and your feelings toward uh, large organizations and the ways in which they produce food, corporations, nation states, so forth. Your feelings about modern agriculture. In the first place, the most obvious error that has taken place is that agriculture and horticulture have been given two different names. In actual fact, there is no differentiation between them whatever, other than a huge falsity. Horticulture is the great art of the culture of the world of plants. And agriculture has become a pseudonym of that whereby it has come into a piracy of trying to get a quantity out of something which that quantity it cannot give because it is said to be necessary. That all horticulture and agriculture are one, under one system, under one law of nature, and under one obedience of man to nature. And that as such, calling agriculture and horticulture horticulture, it has always been a craft. And all craft is art. And horticulture has always and is always and always will be craft. A great, the greatest of all of the arts, the art of the creation of God. And that in the attempt at piracy of the land to obtain that of it without its comprehensions, has turned it into a utility, has desecrated its meaning, has misapplied its performances and techniques, has destroyed the land by what is called compaction, the destruction of aeration into the soil, which is an absolute essential, which is the destruction of drainage, which is the destruction of the performance of what is known in astronomy and astrology as the revolutionibus performance, the operation of the stars and the planets and the cosmic world that operates in the soil as well as in the air. And it is high time to realize that in the whole of horticulture and agriculture, the atmosphere is as or more important than the soil. And that the atmosphere is never the same one day as another, and that in the fall it is almost opposite in its formations as it is in the spring. And likewise with the soil. Everybody thinks that soil is dirt, is there forever. You can tread on it, jump on it, bite it, eat it, kick it, throw stones on it, do anything you like on it, and it is the same in the fall as it is in the spring, and the same in the winter as the summer. It's completely untrue. The soil of spring is the very opposite to what is soil in the fall. Therefore, I can only sum this up by saying that horticulture is applied by any apprentice approaching the professional art on the smallest possible scale in the smallest handleable area of discovery 
learning its obedience and reverence and its laws and techniques. And as soon as that is applicable and applied, he can increase the area from a quarter acre to a half acre to an acre to two acres to five acres to possibly ten acres to possibly with a good family or a society to twenty acres or even a hundred acres whereupon you could very well say if you like now we have come to a discrimination between the word horticulture and agriculture other than that there is no separation Could you, could you talk about why you came here to Carmel, what it was that drew you to, to this place and what you want to do here? Yes. I would have to immediately eliminate the word I. I feel that all horticulturalists must be obedient to a sense of a leadership that they're led by. And that is a very predominant matter. For instance, I mean, the moment you choose a site for a farm or a home with a garden, uh, you don't say, this shall go here, that shall go there. You ask the garden, the ground that you've chosen, um, what you shall do with it, and it tells you. It tells you very distinctly. I mean, the trees and the plants and the undulations are already there. What led us, the project, to Carmel? was that we required to find a home, a site of land that came under the government of a group of people who would in the future give their protection and permit to its growth as a true school of horticulture which in most senses has yet not been born in the whole world as yet. It's new, it's to come. It's in the future. A good certain amount has happened so far, but the majority has yet to come. The whole beauty of the propagation of plants, of seed, of the formations of gardens themselves, which come from the Persian word pardes, a park, where everybody met to deal with all important matters, which concerns the word paradise. That is a garden. Therefore, the garden doesn't constitute the supply of the kitchen or the pots of the herbs or the pleasant little walk to, do to go down and smell the flowers. It's the whole inner sense of man with his connection with birth, with children and the family, related to nature, related to his hide, which is his home, which is his cave, living under the arms of trees for safety, hidden away from the four elements, and that the garden is his introduction, his step, that leads him to the vision of the whole of nature and creation. And that in coming to this area, we were introduced to the ownership of a group of people whom it was apparent to us held sufficient of that in their attitude to make this school possible in the future that it should be for the whole of the United States of America and international and all the peoples of the world and all the botanicals of the world and that this vision could in that way grow and not be prevented by the general obstructions. Are you are you skeptical? Do you do you uh, you said before, and I'd like you to, to kind of talk about this again that that you have skepticism or problems with talk that concerns quote spirituality quote consciousness and so forth, but isn't related to the earth, isn't related to some kind of material activity, to, to production of... Yes. Uh, this this uh, is true. In a sense, this is personal, you understand, to a degree. Um, when you use the word skeptical, that's a little difficult word for me. I'm not even sure that I fully comprehend its meaning. 
and I do feel very strongly about this today. I feel that in my discovery in the university in observing it, in observing the way in which people live, today everything is divided up, specialised in other words. That the whole thing concerning uh, horticulture and the garden is relationship and disrelationship united. The moment there's an opposition, it must not be disunited, it must become more united. That I do not feel that the verbosity of man's mind can any longer run on a direct route of its own, which it is doing, 90% leading him in all his thoughts, what he feels about everything, even what he feels about God, is out of the verbosity of his mind. I look upon this very sceptically, and many gurus and teachers today are all apparently to be running on that line of talking about views in the mind through words. And none of it, literally none of it, being put into life formation. I find that in the whole law of nature, a complete performance between the two. I see as one of the most exorbitant and exquisite matters in life is what one would call in Goethe's language image, imaginative image, spiritual image. Now he talks about image in the same way that he talks about ide. And there are no words to describe that. But what he does say is that intellect and reason, which you can confine very much into the lines of verbosity, intellect and reason will never tell you the truth. You will only find truth situated in the very centre of image or ide. Therefore, I perceive in the whole of nature spiritual image. I perceive in the whole performance of man in reflection to nature the performance of Ide in action, spiritual living in doing. As the Scandinavians have a remarkable little statement which comes very much to the point and they say, you see, the good Lord gave us all the nuts in the world to eat, but he left us to crack them. And somehow, perhaps the answer to that sits there. In other words, I do believe that today we're inclined to sit back in armchairs on that huge sit-upon and think and gesticulate in thought and there's a very little percentage of performance that goes with it. One can't help help thinking that if for one day the whole of that performance were reversed and there were no sitting and thinking but all action in Ede, the whole world would have a, suddenly a very different appearance. You, you're, what you were talking about before leads into, I think, the next question, uh, which is restoring something of wholeness from this, this specialization. And I'd like you to talk again of what you talked to me about, about the separation into scholar on one hand, peasant on the other hand, and how you see yourself as uniting those polarities in a sense. Indeed. Here is a wonderful subject. I, I think of the utmost simplicity. If one goes back through the different ages and picks them out, I mean the Greek Golden Age, the Phoenician Age, the Great Egyptian, the Ancient Chinese, and onwards and upwards into the great periods of Europe, the huge periods of horticulture which have been colossal 
and even the periods of art, such as Diaghilev and the Russian Ballet and the Renaissance of painting and music. If you look at all of these, you'll find the same thing here. Do you see, there came a period, let us say it was historically written, between about the 12th century and the 15th century. It was at about that time that about 98% of the persons in the civilized Western world were peasants. They were literally all peasants. They lived upon what happened in the four seasons of what the four seasons of the year gave them. Their different crops, they ate those things at the different times of year, and they were compatible, and they kept them just through the winter, and then they got them into next year. And they knew that if they were obedient to those four seasons, and they worked hard and diligently, and were obedient to the laws concerning the land, they would be supplied with their necessities. And they knew very well that if they were not obedient to those laws, but disobeyed them and tried all sorts of other tricks, that they would not be supplied and there would be famine. Now there were about 2% leaving the 98 paysans who, who were also had been peasants but watched all this going on and saw how over hard many of them worked unnecessarily and so they rather sat down and said you know if you did this and if you did that you would get more out of it and it would work better. And those few increased to a few more. And when those few more increased, of course they had families and they had children. And at the same period, all the peasants were having children in rather great quantity. Now it became very obvious that they had two nominalities, these people. The workers, who were said not to think properly or reason at all, because they went by obedience to nature, were known as peasants, and the others built universities and went inside and hid in different rooms and thought things out and called themselves scholars. Now when the peasants had children and the peasants' children observed these scholars all dressed up with beautiful hats on with shiny buttons, eating off gold plates and walking about rather dilettantly and enjoying themselves and beginning to make motor cars or beautiful carriages with ponies, they felt very left out and said to their parents, Hell, father, hell, mother, what's the matter with you? And father said, well, there's nothing else for it. You kids have got to be scholars. And what's more, I'll have to sell the farm and you'll have to go to that college and you'll have to learn to be a scholar. And meantime, of course, the scholars' children all looked down on the peasants and whenever they saw them in the street, they punched their noses or told them they were blithering idiots or dunces. And what was twice seven turned cube root inside out or who was Pythagoras and what did he do when he wasn't in his right mind? And none of them could answer any of those questions, and they all felt blithering fools. Now, it so happened that you must remember that the peasants' children could still produce crops. And you must also realize that the scholars' peasants at that stage could not produce a crop anymore. Uh, they'd become too clever. Now, that grew with the decades after decade after decade, and slowly the peasants' children all began to get into the colleges and of course the colleges split their walls and they had to build very big colleges and then they had to build universities and then they had to build whole cities of universities and then they had to build and then they had to build well, well what, what has really happened is of course today the whole world is a university of scholars and the whole of the countryside is bereft and there aren't any peasants so there's no, nobody to produce any crops nobody any longer with the wisdom of the obedience to nature and everybody telling everybody what they ought to do. So everybody's become a scholar and that's where we are. We're all scholars and nobody can do anything. If you want a nice bit of carpentering done, if you want a nice bit of anything done by hand, nobody can do it. 
they can all tell you the mathematics and there it ends.